Thanks a lot for being with me this evening session and to listen my solo about minimally invasive maxillary sinus approach, which is common for me and I am operated uh, this way via inferior meatus since 15 years and during COVID period also. Uh, and I will try to show you uh, when it's better to use this method with temporary, uh, not a window, a door to the maxillary sinus as mono method mostly in, dent in dental situations, as uh, additional method of approach than operating patients of rhinological profile, and maybe in combination of multiportal surgery. For example, we need sometimes to remove uh, some pathologies uh, in, from lateral part of maxillary sinus or from, from prelacrimal area. This method is very useful. Uh, but before uh, I start to explain this approach, I have huge experience, thousands, thousands cases. Uh, let me remind you about uh, two of my colleagues. We lost them during COVID uh, period, and uh, of course, uh, I respect them uh, very much. First of all, Vladimir Kozlov. He was head of ENT service of uh, Moscow Presidential Hospital, and he was a very nice man, uh, very nice colleague, and he was uh, representative of Russian Federation in ERS uh, society more than 10 years. And his influence to our society, I mean, in Russia, is uh, great, mm -hmm. and he organized first first courses in Yaroslavl. Uh, many of you know him well, and this is uh, one of his last photos in Chicago Rhinology World Congress uh, with our president, Yanis Konstantinidis, together in the uh, Museum of Natural History. This is from my own telephone. I have a lot of good memories about this man who influenced me a lot. And he also spoke about this method of inferometal approach. Then I showed him. He, say, he, he tried to use it in operative uh, theater, and then uh, he said, why I didn't use it before? It's so easy and helpful, and no risks to damage orbiter, for example. And uh, of course, uh, I'm full of memories about Dmitry Kapitanov, who was the head of uh, rhinological unit in Neurosurgical Institute in Moscow. Uh, this man, uh, passed away because of COVID, then operating his neurosurgical patients in year of 56 years old. So I would like to dedicate my presentation to the memory of these two great people. Uh, how we operated during COVID, uh, no matter, uh, maxillary sinus and others, uh, uh, now this photo looks crazy. But we, during the first wave, were, were all afraid of this disease and we protected ourselves. And uh, here I can answer who was ill, this man. Uh, this is my resident, he got ill uh, COVID uh, during Urgen situation. We are always described as a heroes, uh, medical doctors from red hot areas, but never uh, about all of us who operated urgent patients. Uh, Elizabeth was not ill, I was not ill at that time, but later on I uh, got this terrible disease also. Uh, and that was experiments how to operate. In, during the first wave, we reduced our surgery a lot, I mean scheduled surgery, but we operated, like in this case, difficult patients, it's young uh, woman uh, with uh, nasal tumor, we used here also inframeatal approach. We operated her widely. And we described during first wave our some observations and results uh, in international publications together with group of ENT specialists during first uh, wave. Don't forget it was absolutely <laughs> different understanding of the problem at that period. Uh, we published our example uh, then all operative team uh, got ill after urgent patient, patient uh, with uh, larynx tumor uh, complicated with COVID disease. Uh, 
this patient was tracheotomized urgently under local anesthesia, and all team was completely protected with excellent dress, and they, they were all got ill in few days. Uh, among them, uh, surgeon number one, uh, lady, 30 years old, uh, had severe, severe uh, clinical picture of COVID. Uh, let me skip this. And now we are not protecting ourselves, but our surgery is not so active as before, 30% less, uh, because of uh, positive COVID tests in patients. We uh, sometimes cancel or delay our surgeries. This is a photo a few days ago during a pediatric rhinological course in Moscow. Uh, together with uh, Yuri Rusetsky, he is also here. We moved to the Saloniki right from Moscow. But I'm from St. Petersburg, let me, you, me remind you. This photo made two hours ago by my residence. This is uh, my clinic right now, two hours ago. This is our department, First Pavlov Medical University. It's not main building, but there is some ambulance and this floor belongs to ENT and craniofacial surgery. That's why we are operating a lot of maxillary sinus pathology patients after uh, some manipulations of our colleagues, craniofacial surgeons, dental practitioners, uh, and uh, implantation surgeons. That's why uh, we are deeper, <laughs> uh, understand a little bit uh, this problem because of our common activities. Uh, so, some slides is in Russian, but don't worry, I will translate, it's uh, very easy. There is description of open approach, and one of the observations after interior wall approach, you see here traces of surgical instruments from anterior wall to posterior wall, and this is stretching scar, we can only uh, resect this uh, scar with a uh, laser, but you see here a uh, complete window which cannot be closed. This is, of course, abnormal. I speak about temporary approach, open then close, without any anatomical changes uh, to uh, save this uh, necessary anatomy in patients who don't need uh, correction of osteomyital unit, non-rhinological patients, but sometimes this temporary approach is useful in patients of rhinological profile. So, uh, all approaches is well known long time. Anterior wall, tooth cana root canal, uh, inferior meatus, very old, middle meatus, very old, uh, multi-portal approach, useful now to remove angiofibromas of huge uh, shape and size. It's all well known, but for small pathologists, we of course use uh, minimal approaches, minimal destruction of uh, uh, all walls of maxillary sinus. And I never use uh, many years anterior wall because we can match more possibilities via inferior meatus. And that is endonasal approaches. Already we are narrowing our wide understanding of different approaches. Uh, inferior meatus was described before uh, middle meatus. And we all use in Russia commonly maxillary sinus puncture. It's very simple procedure and very helpful. Uh, reduces a lot uh, our FES activities because any acute sinusitis, sinusitis uh, can be treated immediately with the same effect as first surgery, but it's outpatient procedure. It's uh, forgotten in some countries, but in Russia it's still useful. And if you check old tut tutorial books or modern tutorial books, uh, there is a description of uh, penetration via inferior meatus, but it's always chisel or strong instrument or drill. This is not so. Uh, uh, using this maxillary sinus puncture, everyone knows this uh, wall is very thin. Almost 90 Thanks a lot for being with me this evening session. 
and to listen my solo about minimally invasive maxillary sinus approach, which is common for me, and I am operated uh, this way via inferior meatus since 15 years and during COVID period also. Uh, and I will try to show you uh, when it's better to use this method with temporary, uh, not a window, a door to the maxillary sinus as mono method mostly in, dent in dental situations, as uh, additional method of approach than operating patients of rhinological profile, and maybe in combination of multiportal surgery. For example, we need sometimes to remove uh, some pathologies uh, in, from lateral part of maxillary sinus or from, from prelacrimal area. This method is very useful. Uh, but before uh, I start to explain this approach, I have huge experience, thousand ca thousands of cases. Uh, let me remind you about uh, two of my colleagues. We lost them during COVID uh, period, and uh, of course, uh, I respect them uh, very much. First of all, Vladimir Kozlov. He was head of ENT service of uh, Moscow Presidential Hospital, and he was a very nice man, uh, very nice colleague, and he was uh, representative of Russian Federation in ERS uh, society more than 10 years. And his influence to our society, I mean, in Russia, is uh, great, mm -hmm. and he organized first first courses in Yaroslavl. Uh, many of you know him well, and this is uh, one of his last photos in Chicago Rhinology World Congress uh, with our president, Yanis Konstantinidis, together in uh, Museum of Natural History. This is from my own telephone. I have a lot of good memories about this man who influenced me a lot. And he also spoke about this method of inferometal approach Then I showed him. He, say, uh, he, he tried to use it in operative uh, theater, and then uh, he said, why I didn't use it before? It's so easy and helpful, and no risks to damage orbita, for example. And uh, of course, uh, I'm full of memories about Dmitry Kapitanov, who was the head of uh, rhinological unit in Neurosurgical Institute in Moscow. Uh, this man, uh, passed away because of COVID, then operating his neurosurgical patients in year of 56 years old. So I would like to dedicate my presentation to the memory of these two great people. Uh, how we operated during COVID, uh, no matter uh, maxillary sinus and others, uh, uh, now this photo looks crazy. But we, during the first wave, we were, were all afraid of this disease and we protected ourselves. And uh, here I can answer who was ill, this man. Uh, this is my resident, he got ill uh, COVID uh, during Urgen situation. We are always described as a heroes, uh, medical doctors from red hot areas, but never uh, about all of us who operated urgent patients. Uh, Elizabeth was not ill, I was not ill at that time, but later on I uh, got this terrible disease also. Uh, and that was experiments how to operate. In, during first wave, we reduced our surgery a lot, I mean scheduled surgery, but we operated, like in this case, difficult patients, it's young uh, woman uh, with uh, nasal tumor, we used here also inframeatal approach. We operated her widely. And we described during first wave our some observations and results uh, in international publications together with group of ENT specialists during first uh, wave. Don't forget it was absolutely <laughs> different understanding of the problem at that period. Uh, we published our example uh, then all operative team uh, got ill after urgent patient, patient uh, with uh, larynx tumor uh, complicated with COVID disease. 
this patient was tracheotomized urgently under local anesthesia, and all team was completely protected with excellent dress, and they, they were all got ill in a few days. Uh, among them, uh, surgeon number one, uh, lady, 30 years old, uh, had severe, severe uh, clinical picture of COVID. Uh, let me skip this. And now we are not protecting ourselves, but our surgery is not so active as before, 30% less, uh, because of uh, positive COVID tests in patients. We uh, sometimes cancel or delay our surgeries. This is a photo a few days ago during a pediatric rhinological course in Moscow. Uh, together with uh, Yuri Rusetsky, he is also here. We moved to the Saloniki right from Moscow. But I'm from St. Petersburg, let me you, may remind you. This photo made two hours ago by my residence. This is uh, my clinic right now, two hours ago. This is our department, First Paul of Medical University. It's not main building, but there is some ambulance and this floor belongs to ENT and craniofacial surgery. That's why we are operating a lot of maxillary sinus pathology patients after uh, some manipulations of our colleagues, craniofacial surgeons, dental practitioners, uh, and uh, implantation surgeons. That's why uh, we are deeper <laughs> uh, understand a little bit uh, this problem because of our common activities. Uh, so, some slides is in Russian, but don't worry, I will translate, it's uh, very easy. There is description of open approach, and one of the observations after interior wall approach, you see here traces of surgical instruments from anterior wall to posterior wall, and this is stretching scar, we can only uh, resect this uh, scar with a uh, laser, but you see here a uh, complete window which cannot be closed. This is, of course, abnormal. I speak about temporary approach, open then close, without any anatomical changes uh, to uh, save this uh, necessary anatomy in patients who don't need uh, correction of osteomyatal unit, non-rhinological patients, but sometimes this temporary approach is useful in patients of rhinological profile. So, uh, all approaches is well known long time. Anterior wall, tooth can root canal, uh, inferior meatus, very old, middle meatus, very old, uh, multi-portal approach, useful now to remove angiofibromas of huge uh, shape and size. It's all well known, but for small pathologists, we of course use uh, minimal approaches, minimal destruction of uh, uh, all walls of maxillary sinus. And I never use uh, many years anterior wall because we can match more possibilities via inferior meatus. And that is and the nasal approaches. Already we are narrowing our wide understanding of different approaches. Uh, inferior meatus was described before uh, middle meatus. And we all use in Russia commonly maxillary sinus puncture. It's a very simple procedure and very helpful. Uh, reduces a lot uh, our FES activities because any acute sinusitis, sinusitis uh, can be treated immediately with the same effect as first surgery, but it's outpatient procedure. It's uh, forgotten in some countries, but in Russia it's still useful. And if you check old tut tutorial books or modern tutorial books, uh, there is a description of uh, penetration via inferior meatus, but it's always chisel or strong instrument or drill. This is not so. Uh, uh, using this maxillary sinus puncture, everyone knows this uh, wall is very thin. Almost 99% uh, maxillary sinuses can be uh, examined and flushed 
it's blind procedure. But if you use endoscope, it's already not blind procedure. So this is wrong. Chisel, not necessary. No strong instrument, just uh, nice respiratory. Interior wall, traumatic, also uh, blind. It's blind procedure. And you cannot control walls around this endoscope or uh, this special tube. Moment. Wrong way. Sorry. Wrong way. Mm -hmm. This procedure now is not indicated, it's uh, terrible uh, open procedures, and in benign cases, we never use this. Never. I refuse totally of this method. Now, this uh, video shows when we started to operate via inferior meatal temporary approach with formation of video. This is date 2006, but that was originally analog video. That means two years before, about. This is only one document which can prove we started to operate via inferior meatus. This is maxillary sinus puncture and lavage. So uh, maxillary sinus puncture and uh, lavage flash looks like that. Very effective, very inferior meatus. And this is f our first uh, years and months of endoscope usage. When we started to operate via, uh, with endoscope via middle meatus, of course, we can operate any sinuses, any kinds of pathologies, but uh, now let's focus on maxillary sinus. This is different patients, three different patients, uh, and uh, let me describe by, by one. This is view via middle meatus, 70 degrees scope, no pathology. Then I use this one, this is the same instrument, very simple spoon or any respiratory you can use. I make this door and then look to the up, and you see here screw huge foreign body which was not observed via middle meatus. So, and it's helpful. You see, we got it without prelacrimal approach, without any serious damages. Uh, my approach via uh, middle meatus was wrong at that time. It was not necessary, but looking at the three-dimensional CT, I decided I can remove it via middle meatus. But uh, situation sh shows it's wrong. And middle meatus approach is more traumatic for this patient. We removed it immediately and now sinus is closed. Normal anatomy and this is, uh, I may say, urgent situation because uh, dental practitioner uh, get a lot of money for this procedure. Uh, it's a uh, medical legal aspect, very serious, patient usually aggressive and we explain them, we will make you small procedure and then remove. So sometimes I save my uh, in, uh, dental practitioners, co colleagues, and implantation surgeons. And this is two different uh, computer tomography, coronal plane. You see, surgeon experienced enough was not successful via middle meatus. A lot of maxillary, uh, maxillary sinus cyst, part or some polyps, the uh, same as here. Uh, that is uh, sometimes limitation of middle meatal approach. And don't forget about risks. For beginners, a lot of risks. This method, via inferior meters, less risks. Then examining patients of, uh, with dentally originated pathologies, sometimes we have cuts like this. Uh, only uh, lower third of maxillary sinus can be observed and examined. Uh, so this patient uh, came to me with this, these scans, and then you are not uh, focusing enough on this pathology. You can operate them, uh, him or her. But look at this area, please. And this is a situation when uh, wide CT scanning is indicated extremely. We perform Again, again, cone beam procedure. It's very easy and cheap, few minutes, and you have absolutely different information. It's uh, inverted papilloma case. I have several observations of such a situation after dental scanning. 
uh, real scanning <laughs> of uh, all uh, sinuses looks more and more complicated and dangerous. Of course, we cancelled uh, dental implantation or any procedures in maxillary sinus. We removed all this tumor and um, uh, dental procedure must be delayed, for example, one or two years or sometimes maybe more. Now again about limitations of uh, middle meatal approach. If we need to control this area or clean this area, no scopes which can uh, illustrate this area which can show this area. Maybe fiber optical approach, but we don't have such instruments to reach this area. Uh, you need to open maxillary sinus in the area of uh, nasal floor sometimes to control this area. You may say this is clean sinuses, no indications for surgery, but sometimes it's happened. Uh, this is different patients, but similar anatomy. They are not relatives. You see, needs dental implantation and some pathology. Also, you may say here, but that was uh, nasal polyposis, unilateral, not uh, inverted papilloma. Of course, we uh, check uh, morphology always and sending biopsy. So uh, this patient indicated for surgery in the middle meatus area and to clean maxillary sinus floor, we need additional approach. And it's not worsening results of middle antrostomy because you close this area and it gives absolutely normal anatomy of maxillary sinus. This is, uh, once again, slide which shows some limitations. And I, I will try to prove uh, my sentence about limitations. It looks like a non-experienced surgeon operated. No. Uh, this is uh, intraoperative uh, navigation view, uh, screenshots. Then we opened uh, as wide as possible uh, middle meatus. And I used to check which area can be reached by curved instruments with this uh, ostium seeker. And this is it. You, sometimes you can see this area, but instruments can reach only this area. About two-thirds or half of sinus cannot be controlled with instruments. Sometimes it's illusion. I see all sinus. No, this is wrong. And we cannot reach this by curved, maximally curved instruments. And other situation, we need to clean all sinus, of course, and I can reach anterior wall. Sometimes it's really unpredictable which area can be controlled, which area can, cannot be controlled. You can leave small foreign body or uh, some pathology which is uh, important also before uh, uh, tooth procedures or uh, dental implantations. Once again about risks to damage orbital wall. This is a case of small maxillary sinus, it's not silent sinus syndrome, but uh, very similar. Then you open here, a lot of chances to damage orbiter. If you open here, no chances to damage orbiter, or much less. And then I operating uh, silent sinus syndrome, I first open here, then use some probes, instruments, to move this area. And then I see uh, movement from backside. I know where to penetrate to sinus to pre and prevent 100% of orbital wall damage. This is very risky. Luckily, we have three-dimensional computer tomography. Same situation here. It's better to open, move, check this area, penetrate maxillary sinus via uncinate process, then close this uh, temporary window. Now surgical stages, uh, for example, it's easy patient, and we operate him, I may say, office based, based or one day surgery. Uh, infil, infil, first application of lidocaine solution, infiltration, then I cut through, through all layers in one cut. Mostly it's possible, then open window, and preserve this flap 
to press inside sinus. And then after removal of pathologies, I close it and that's it. Uh, no nasal package necessary or other procedures. Uh, Post-operative uh, bleeding is very uncommon. I don't remember cases. And then we operate middle meters. Post-operative, some bleeding is really possible. And that's why usually I close uh, middle meters with some very soft package. Now, and stages how it's, it looks like. Second day, fifth day, seventh day after surgery, 15th day. No, no traces of surgery at all. And if necessary, revision surgery, you can open this door again and then close. Sometimes we repeat surgeries uh, du during a sinus lifting procedure. Before we clean, if something wrong after surgery, we open again and then uh, clean sinus via same cut, same door. And how it looks in uh, two months, for example. Smooth scar and nothing else. No changes uh, on CT scans. It looks sometimes like non-operated sinus. Uh, some couple of words about aerodynamics. It's models which was designed by aircraft engineering uh, in Russia, but it's a little bit copy of Belgian group, which also used this method of analysis, but different groups of uh, engineers. And how this, uh, they call it fluid dynamics, but really it's aerodynamics. It's mm -hmm. just a word. Uh, this is after temporary maxillary sinus approach. Uh, zero, uh, zero, uh, zero, zero, one uh, milliliters per second, and this is absolutely normal aerodynamics. I no, don't speak about recirculation because it's, it cannot exist in this case because you open then close. And then look uh, at, at this, uh, and now, after in middle metal approach, it's absolutely different. It's too much, 38 milliliters per second. It's too much for sinus. Uh, and in our climate area, in cold country, it's very important to prevent such extra uh, aerodynamics. And this is two window done not by us after some surgeon, but uh, this, uh, Milli, uh, 70 milliliters per second, 18, almost 18, is much better than previous. This is a case of recirculation, of course, but aerodynamics uh, is, is better than in previous case. Now, clinical examples, one by one. Uh, always we speak about risks to damage Hasner valve. This is here, and this is a uh, place of uh, typical maxillary sinus puncture, which is common in Russia. Here we treated several weeks chronic sinusitis of absolutely non-rhinologic origination. I will show you this case uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, this area of uh, lacrimal pathways drainage in, in inferior meatus almost always can be controlled and find. Sometimes you can see uh, make-up traces, then, uh, then it's lady, of course. And here you see completely lacrimal pathways with a simple scope. This is 70 degree scopes. Uh, during surgery, we are controlling completely this area. Now cases, one by one. This is small cyst uh, indications uh, for removal of this cyst, non-rhinological. Dental practitioner asked me to remove it. They cannot remove via inferior meters, and I don't think it's a good idea to remove this small pathology via uh, middle meters. Now I go via inferior. First, I find lacrimal pathways, local anesthesia, premedication, of course. And that's it. Very easy. 90% cases, it's very easy to open this window. One cut and then medialization of posterior flap. And this is it. Cyst, you can observe it completely with a zero degree scopes. And uh, 
expensive curved instruments, mostly not necessary to use. Flamingo sometimes. Usually we use simple Blexley, and posterior part of maxillary sinus can be controlled with a straight forceps. So it removed completely, and we close sinus, no changes, and the patient can go home in two hours. And then, I, you see, I checked lacrimal pathways again. Case of non-rhinologic -rhino pathology. Implant, of course, it's ser serious complication. We need to remove it. Luckily, at the same day, day after trying to insert it. This patient indicated for uh, sinus lifting procedure, of course. That was mistake of this specialist. And now I cut, and you see it's close to prolacrimal area. It's not posterior part of inf inf inferior meatus. It's easy to open. No risks, no painful. And if you don't need to drill inside maxillary sinus, it's a painless procedure, very easy. Also for these nervous patients with uh, dental implant, I removed it with suction tube. Be careful not to drop it uh, to nasopharynx because patient can swallow it. And this is it. Now we examine sinus. It's clean enough, then close. I use different instruments because I have only one, this raspatory, cotal knife, but a very special shape. And again, uh, approach is the same. It's a common approach for different pathologies. But about uh, illusions of vision. Now I use, I think it's 70 degrees scopes, very old video also, and I see this. Then I clean sinus and think it's enough. With flamingo forceps, it looks completely, no, in different video I will show you. This is it, simple cyst. But I have, ah, this is comparable. And we, we look in, inside the sinus and think it's clean enough. We removed all pathologies, but then I use another scope this is it. This is uh, endoscope with changeable angle of view. Then I move. It's not flexible. It's rigid. And you see a lot of edema or polyp on anterior wall. But before, with using of 70 degrees scope, I thought it's enough to observe and no more pathology. It's not important edema or polyp. Uh, for rhinologists, but it's important before sinus lifting procedure. And very important to check what is inside. It can be not a uh, retention cyst. I will show you examples. Mm -hmm. Not possible to show all videos. Another kind of non-rhinologic pathology, dental root. Uh, surgery is indicated, but wh why I uh, need to distract this wonderful osteomyatal unit to remove non-rhinogenic pathology with some already fun fungi which is provocating inflammation in maxillary sinus. If you don't remove implant in two days, Sometimes uh, mucosa reacting a lot, and it's difficult to find it in few days because of inflammation, edema, and some polyps, which is uh, growing immediately in few days, sometimes hours. Here you see lacrimal pathways, not easy to find, but this is it, Hasner valve, very small, and I open behind, sometimes before. Uh, very common question, uh, what is this, prelacrimal or postlacrimal? Usually it's sublacrimal because I'm lower from lacrimal pathways, but sometimes, if necessary, I open prelacrimally. Different pathologies you see here, very low at maxillary sinus floor and anterior wall, 
area which cannot be observed via middle meters, and you see foreign body and different kinds of cysts. Uh, why do we need uh, to wide a little bit our activities than operating maxillary sinus cysts? Because sometimes it's not cysts. This looks like retention cysts. No indication for surgery and no symptoms in this patient. So commonly we don't operate them. Let's check what is inside. That was again order of dental surgeon. Please, Sergei, open and check. It looks like retention cyst, maybe with mucin, but mucin is contraindication for sinus lifting. Clean retention cyst is not contraindication, depending on experience. And then I open it, it's pus, it's not mucin. It's bacterial inflammation without any symptoms. It's like Chernobyl, very dangerous. In any viral infection or then operating uh, maxilla uh, starting to perform sinus lifting, it's very risky. And uh, if a uh, maxillofacial surgeon will find it during his procedure, so implantation cancelled. Otherwise, it leads to severe complications. Now, one more. Rare pathology, but I have about five cases now. Maxillary sinus osteoma. Why do we need to open this? It's not rhinogenic. Uh, anterior wall mm -hmm. is not best solution. I prefer my method, but <laughs> uh, not mine. It's for everyone. Ma, uh, but I use now general anesthesia. First patient I operated under local, this one but it's a little bit sensitive. Not extremely pain, uh, painful, but uh, it's better to use general. Inferior meatus is wide enough. It looks narrow only in the interior part. Then you go in, into uh, inferior meatus, it's huge. Uh, also about medialization of turbine. Turbin. Inferior turbine, then you remove, you can easily return. Then you medialize uh, middle meatus, it's difficult to return it or uh, it's uh, carrying and closing uh, in a middle meatal approach. This is osteoma. You use only direct scope and spoon or chisel, if necessary drills of course. And we removed it at the same way. Similar example, also we need to remove, but why? It's not malignancy, it's uh, morphologically ma uh, maxillary sinus osteoma. But it leads in all our observations to repeated maxillary sinusitis without changes in this area. It leads always to maxillary sinusitis. Then I open. You see, always easy. A lot of videos. Sometimes it's a little bit complicated but mostly it's useful. Middle meters, I'm not against middle meters. I use it a lot and in combination or as a single method in nasal polyposis, I open all sinuses with the middle meters, but this is very nice additional approach. And this is clean sinus and no changes in the uh, maxillary sinus walls. It's better to preserve Dam additional damages. This is observation of uh, left maxillary sinus cyst and right maxillary sinus osteoma. Absolutely clean and these defects closed by mucosa. It's a bony mode of computer tomography. And this is example of inflammation after sinus lifting procedure. I left small window uh, to use this approach in post-operative period. And then you have this, this small window, it's closing in time, like uh, tympanic membrane perforation. And the uh, maxillofacial surgeon asked me to clean sinus. We clean it, remove pathologies, but no purulence, just uh, severe edema. And this is sinus lifting material. It's protected and the patient can be uh, implanted. 
to have teeth, it's important for all of us. Now, case of uh, prelacrimal implant location, I showed it at the first slides. I don't think it's necessary to repeat. I have another observation. The patient of 46 years old, and you see here prelacrimal foreign body. Uh, some surgeons recommend to use prelacrimal approach. And this is our in inferior meatal approach. I open sinus uh, more anteriorly as, as possible, and you see here fungus ball with a 70 degree scope. Not necessary to cut uh, inferior turbinate, just open it uh, as possible before anterior from uh, lacrimal pathways. And this is it. Sinus is closed, problem is solved completely. Now, uh, pathology which is not uh, benign, it's uh, residual maybe, I don't op operate this patient before, we got him this, this clinical picture and only one symptom was post-nasal drip. Uh, man about 60 years old without any complaints. Please, doctor, remove uh, this uh, post-nasal drip. We made computer tomography, and he couldn't explain his story. We couldn't find anything, and we decided it's inverted papilloma and how to check this. To make biopsy, of course, and you see sinus wall is thin. We opened it widely. And with direct scope, you can control completely this area. We removed it with uh, different instruments, uh, with some parts of posterior maxillary sinus wall, uh, cleaned it completely, and uh, this surgery was done many years back, and this patient is fine. And here I combine two approaches. This is already middle meatus, you can recognize, of course, it's general anesthesia, and now we have uh, two approaches. I use endoscope via inferior meatus and uh, spoons and instruments, drills via middle meatus. It's very useful and also easy. We removed it completely and this patient uh, is still okay as far as I know. Now. Finally, this is just proportion. We operated much more patients, but middle meters most cases, inferior only mostly in single maxillary sinusitis. And combined approach, 98%, it's mostly patients with chronic nasal polyposis. This is kinds of pathologies, cysts, foreign bodies, polyps, chronic sinusitis, uh, different kinds of uh, sinusitis, fibrous dysplasia, of course, and osteoma, it's for middle, uh, uh, inferior metal approach. Uh, we described briefly this method in different uh, Russian and international magazines, and our uh, most recent publications, it's uh, Laryngoscope 2020, and we analyzed here not approaches, but uh, external approach, and. Uh, and the nasal approach in children. And it was published. Uh, what was the main result? <laughs> uh, that sounds funny. Uh, results, uh, according to chronic sinusitis, is the same. No matter, external approach or endonasal approach. But morbidity level is much higher in external approach, of course. Uh, that's why we must use endonasal approach in pediatric group of patients. This is some Russian magazines, uh, patent of Russian Federation. This is my ENT department, my lovely stuff. Uh, and please, finally, um, my last words, don't forget about IRS ESEAN 2020, which will be held in St. Petersburg uh, next summer, uh, middle of July, G good period in St. Petersburg, but last year's terrible hot, 
which is <laughs> unusual for us, but we will use, of course, air conditioning. It will be held in the historical center of St. Petersburg. It's easy to reach us, to find us. Uh, this uh, site, website will start to work in a few weeks. We are almost ready to start after this September. Then uh, also European Congress uh, will, fin will finish its work. We will start to announce everything. And this is symbol, uh, famous Russian writer Gogol. Uh, sounds strange, but he wrote a very nice book, which is called Nose. That's why we use him as a symbol. Very strange story, but uh, at the opening ceremony, I will try to explain this story also. Thank you for your attention. And if, if you like, we have three, four minutes for questions. Thank you. Only one method of control is, of course, computer tomography. Or if you used both approaches, you can check later on via middle meters. But I don't remember exactly patients who returned. It's very uncommon. Uh, usually in Russia, uh, if a patient don't satisfact, he will return to you, <laughs> not to other doctors. We are observing some of them years and years, 10 years and so on. Not specially, but results is very good, really. We forget about dental maxillary sinusitis. Usually one procedure, that's it. But we still use maxillary sinus puncture in urgent situation. I can open any sinus, but I still recommend some patients to do this old-fashioned procedure. Very helpful. Uh, acute sinusitis or non-treated sinusitis, very useful. Now uh, we must to recommend antibiotics, but I remember time when we never used antibiotics. We had it, but maxillary sinus puncture more effective. One procedure, sometimes that's it. Two or three procedures. That's it. Uh, insurance companies don't like this procedure, but our doctors like it. It's very effective. Yes, question. We never damaged. We are always uh, trying to find it first before we start. But I have some cases when we damaged, but then no, any negative results. Because uh, lacrimal fluid usually clean this area and you recommend massage, for example, li like in uh, kinder patient, in child pa childhood patients, newborns, very common. Thank you, have a great evening.